Welcome everyone to the now third Guidance Point Advisors Roundtable. Um, thank you all for joining us here. Um, we're just going to kind of get into a little bit of an update, um, you know, with us here at Guidance Point. Um, and also just kind of want to share with everyone out there that uh, may be listening kind of what we're seeing happening in the markets, uh, what we're talking about with our clients, kind of things like that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the the general kind of purpose of today's show and, and today's conversations, um, just to get together and kind of share some of our team with you and, and also share what's going on in the, the investment arenas. Um, so to kind of kick things off, we'll just start, we'll keep it light here and do a little introduction of everyone joining us today. Um, so I'll just kind of go around the call here. If you could just kind of introduce yourself, your role at Guidance Point, um, for those who may not know, and then we do have kind of a fun icebreaker question that I'm going to ask everyone here. Um, and that is, if you were Santa Claus, what type of cookie would you want to be left out for you on Christmas Eve? So I'll kind of start. Um, so my name is Curtis Worcester. I'm an investment consultant here at Guidance Point Advisors. Um, my favorite cookie, it doesn't even have to be a Christmas cookie, is gingerbreads. Um, so that's an easy hands down one for me. So give me all the gingerbread cookies um, and I will kind of rotate it off to Wes. Thanks, Curtis. Um, to answer that, well, first of all, my name is Wes Del Cole. Uh, I'm the managing partner of Guidance Point Advisors. Uh, I'm based out of the Boston area. Uh, and from a cookie standpoint, I think you gotta, you gotta know you're doing a lot of volume that night. <laughs> so I just stick with something like an Oreo, just quick right. and easy and move on to the next one. Cause it's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of consumption. I like mm -hmm. that. I like that. You're thinking ahead. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of rotate to you, Chris. Chris Del Cole. Uh, I'm also based out of the Boston area as a financial advisor for Guidance Point. And um, my cookie choice would be uh, oatmeal raisin and not just oatmeal raisin, but a chewy oatmeal raisin cookie. Mm. All right. That's important. You got to got to lay that out there. Um, yeah. And, and last but not <laughs> least here, Ben. Hey, everybody. Uh, ben Smith. Uh, I'm an investment consultant with Guidance Point Advisors as well. Uh, my my cookie, if I was Santa Claus, I think that's a good point about volume. I was I was first mm. thing in peanut butter. Um, so that that probably would not be good from the volume perspective. So probably chocolate chip would be the one I'd have to go with is good, classic, you know, kids easy to make it, you know, doesn't, you don't want to mess, have the kids mess it up, right? So you want to make sure it's, it's easy, quick, kid accessible there too, because uh, Santa Claus has a, has a big job to do on, on Christmas Eve. I like that. I like that. Um, so now that we're all hungry, um, so <laughs> I'm going to kind of dive in here a little bit. Um, and we just kind of want to work through some questions with you guys and, and kind of hear your thoughts and ideas. Um, and I'll kind of probably rotate through in that same order, um, if that sounds all right. So Wes, we'll kind of start here. So obviously, you know, there's been a lot going on in the world, um, certainly in 2020, 2021, that have kind of invest, uh, impacted the investable markets. Um, just love to hear on kind of what you're seeing specifically and, you know, what you saw maybe in 2020. 21 there just a kind of a wrap up yeah it's it's an interesting question and it, it, i think there's a lesson in it even for from an advisory standpoint but also for clients and investors that if you would ask that question a week ago in terms of sort of what's going on in the markets um i would have said that the you know the focus has been on inflation, right? There's the expectations of rising interest rates and rising bond yields. Um, and the Fed is in this tough spot, right? Where if they raise too quickly, they, they, they risk you know, cooling the economy. If they don't do it quick enough, you could get this real spike in inflation. But that seems to all have been tabled uh, over the last week because of the Omicron uh, variant has mm. kind of taken center stage. And, um, you know, that just shows you how quickly things can change in terms of what the focus is, where, uh, you know, traders and, and investors are, are, what they're thinking about. And, you know, you hear this, this term all the time about, you know, risk on and risk off. And we're, we're filming this or, or recording this on Tuesday after Thanksgiving, 
And the Friday, the day after Thanksgiving was a really, uh, the market took a huge dive. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at what was happening in, during that, it was really kind of a move into these what are considered safe haven assets, right? Of like government debt and gold and maybe even some currencies and a move away from some of the, the growth equities, maybe riskier corporate bonds, things like that. So I think that that's something that has been playing out over 2021. And we may see more of that going into 2022. And it's all sort of centered, though, I think, assuming the variant situation we can get under control, I think the Fed plays a big role, but we can you know, talk about 22, 2022 later, but um, has in the past year and will continue to in 2022. Like that, Chris. Uh, what a what are kind of your takes on on what you saw in 2021? Yeah, like uh, Wes said, uh, the um, obviously the economy and the markets themselves rebounded a lot faster than anyone expected. Um, uh, and if you uh, think back to the middle of 2020, um, the whole manufacturing sector of the global economy said, "Okay, we're probably not going to get much demand." for the next 12 months and effectively shut things down. Um, and no one anticipated that it would turn around so quickly. And of course it's rearing its head in terms of uh, um, flowing through as inflation right now. Uh, is it gonna be here for uh, the long term? We don't know. Uh, I, I would go with the bond predicting, uh, predictions um, that the break-even uh, rate that is being priced into the tips market is a 3%. And uh, that's a lot higher than it has been. You know, we look back for the last 10, 20 years and we were looking at one and a half or lower percent inflation per, per annum. Uh, so if we get into maybe a 3%, um, uh, it would only imply that the bond market is so overpriced right now. Um, uh, and I don't know if we're going to get a 10 year that goes from one and a half percent up to 2% or higher. But uh, the thing that has been really interesting the last year is that we've been at negative real rates, inflation eating into your earnings on what you earn on a government bond. Uh, to a, a negative rate for so long. Um, so that was interesting. And then uh, the, just the, um, the way that the equity market has developed into such a growth oriented um, uh, market, you know, close to 50% of the market is uh, driven by the largest tech companies. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and so much of it is gonna be based on in terms of its valuation of low interest rates. So. Two different ways you look at it. if if interest rates rise, long term interest rates rise, it should be a re revaluation of uh, pricing across the board in the equity world. Um, now, now it's not happening, and the Fed has got, as Wes said, a really tough job in front of it uh, in terms of tapering and also ultimately maybe raising short term rates. Um, but that's the, the 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 themes that I've been you know thinking about living for the last uh 12 months yeah um yeah certainly a lot a lot going on and a lot to think about there um ben what are kind of your reactions to you know both everything that wes and, and chris just laid out but then also kind of what you saw and looking back on the year so it's always toughest to answer the the third time through on this question so <laughs> i'm going to do my best here um I, I think when you look at and I'll, I'll just kind of talk about um just asset returns in general and kind of what happened because i think when you look at 2020 is you know as chris was kind of saying technology really led the way here was we saw a lot of the returns were just really based in the technology area especially in if you look at style of investment growth was really what led the way here in 2020 and and i think as as investors were kind of realizing hey the rest of the market maybe got left behind and didn't do as well it didn't recover as well uh i think then capital market flows really flowed into the rest of the um equity area that really hadn't done as well and quickly in 2021 we saw value really just pick up and and lead the way and and now i think uh, as we're kind of leading the second half of this year, we really saw just kind of now all equities kind of getting equal performance here at, as kind of value had caught up. So earnings continue to be uh, pretty strong. I think for uh, 
from the corporate side. So that justifies a lot of the prices. And I know what we're hearing from a lot of clients right now is I'm really scared about a bubble. I'm, I'm really thinking about, Hey, stocks have run so far so fast. And is this justifiable? And, and when, uh, when is the next shoe going to drop? And I think when you look at, um, again, earnings, earnings continue to support a level of price. Well, yes, PE is still a, uh, a, uh, elevated level. It, it actually, uh, PE levels have been coming down here throughout 2021, which is, I think is important because I, I think that shows sustained economic recovery. And that's, it's also, I think, very normal from a bear market perspective of what happens afterwards. Prices tend to lead the way before earnings start showing up um, in the numbers. So I, I think that that also is supportive, I think, from what we saw here thus far. And to kind of what Wes said, if you, at, if you kind of go back and rewind the tape to what we said last year, um, we're probably going to to have a similar mantra here of, hey, we just had really big uh, returns here. Things look really great. Um, so let's let's kind of lead into, uh, again, we'll, we'll kind of talk about our comments about leading 2022 in a minute. But I think that's, that's there, there's all, always going to be caution when you experience the level of returns that we saw here going uh, so far in 20, now in 21. But also, uh, you know, in West kind of brought up, we had a little bit of a market hiccup on Black Friday. Yeah. And now, now with this new variant of COVID, we're, we're in today, I know on a, on a daily basis, we're seeing today um, on November 30th, another kind of hiccup in the market. Uh, but also kind of keeping in mind, hey, there's also some profit taking that happens when you see very strong returns throughout a, a calendar year and there's an excuse to take profit. I think that makes things worse sometimes too, is sometimes mm -hmm. I think people pile in and maybe this is the start of something down and I'm going to take some profits while I can, especially when there's maybe uh, on people's mind is, is taxes and maybe taxes might be, go be going up and capital gains might be a concern. So I think those are a lot of the things that we've been kind of juggling here in 2021. Um, but I, I think having this mindset about asset allocation, diversification, making sure that money is, is really well spread out and it's supporting our clients' financial plans. I think having those two things tied always, making sure that those check-in points with our clients that uh, um, that those things are always aligned um, has been a lot of the conversations we've been having so far. So long-winded uh, uh, kind of answer, but I, I think that's that's where we've been spending a lot of time so far. Yeah, no, that that was all great. Um, and I want to kind of keep moving here, and and Ben, I won't I won't be unfair and make you go third again. So I'll let you go first this time. Um, so kind of West teased this a little bit, um, but kind of what do you think is next for us here, both you know in the markets and and kind of with our our approach um, going looking ahead to two thousand twenty two. Yeah, I, I think the first thing is that, uh, tempering expectations, right? I think the first thing we're trying to message to clients is, hey. If you see markets up 20% uh, in a year and in a plus or minus, depending on what's what's happening there. Um, and again, we haven't finished 2021 yet, but when you see some really strong returns in 2021, and that's on top of really strong returns in 2020, you know, probably we're going to be having, you know, maybe, uh, maybe lower below average returns. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a pause. Maybe there is a correction that happens here. Uh, but uh, I think having uh, maybe lower expectations of what we've been getting for returns is I think the first thing to kind of looking out for, um, which I, I think when, when you have market movements is we were on top of rebalancing, I think is a, a, a key point there as well. Uh, and as I think these these things that are happening with COVID and variants and and new things popping up, this is part of the game plan that we hear from the epidemiologists uh, about what happens with with these pandemics and and vaccination rates and what and what's happening there. So I think. Um, again, I, I think being a little more responsive here, being on top of what's happening from an asset allocation perspective is going to be very key here in 2022. Um, and on top of that, as, as, as Chris was saying about supply chain and inflation, I think people are going to be coming to us and saying, maybe I need more money for my accounts. Maybe I need to start withdrawing more. So having these conversations with, with our clients, I think is going to be a, a really important thing about maybe adjusting some of what they need from accounts in addition to planning that out and make sure it's sustainable over time. Hmm. I like that. Um, Chris, what do, what do you think is kind of next in store for us here as we approach 2022? 
I think as, as Ben pointed out, it's really important to, uh, you know, manage people's expectations. Uh, uh, you know, living the last two years, a lot of clients think the equity market just goes up, up, up. Uh, and uh, it is really healthy to have the discussion around volatility. And, and in order to, to achieve the equity like returns, you're gonna have to assume the volatility of the equity market. And uh, so that means it'll go up, it'll also go down. Um, but over time, you're gonna get that uh, outsized return compared to some other asset classes that have lower volatility. So it, I think, um, I, I, we don't know if it's gonna be a down year or if it's, uh, but uh, the expectation of it being another 20% year um, is unlikely. Um, and I think that that's really an important discussion to have um, and, and people to understand in the framework of their portfolio how volatility plays in. Um, I think it's an interesting time in 2022 though, to think about like where you can put your money to work. One, one theme that I didn't mention in 2021 was um, the equity market was almost in, in some respects the only place to go um, because the bond market, which tends to be a dampener in your portfolio, um, if you're earning a, a negative real rate on that fixed income instrument, um, it doesn't pay to, to, to have that in your portfolio, um, uh, independent of the fact that it can be a dampener. Um, but you have to understand the concept of inflation eating into your earnings power on bonds. Um, and uh, so, it's a, 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 an important time to look within the equity market of where you can spread out your exposure so that you're not just in the growth sector, for example, um, as Ben points out, uh, the you know, value and there's other parts of the uh, equity market that you can provide some good, you know, more muted uh, volatility. Um, so I guess my theme for 2022 is potential volatility and, and, and coping with it, dealing with it and managing around it um, for your uh, portfolio. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so I want to kind of rotate here to Wes now. So Wes, I know you started to, to talk about 2022 a little bit ago. Um, so, so kind of what are you thinking as, as we approach the, the end of 2021 and beginning of 2022? I, I mean, I would certainly echo the sentiments of Ben and Chris, but in one way, and as Chris was talking, it was making me think back to 2020 when the, at the onset of the pandemic and, you know, the market dropped precipitously, but the, but the bounce back was so quick that I think a lot of investors got a false sense of what a recession looks like or what it looks like when the market goes down, when on average, it could be 18 months to two years. So when I've been looking forward to 2022 with clients, and I know you guys are building out plans as well, I've been dialing up inflation and I've been muting the returns. So if, if we were using an average of five or 6%, maybe now let's see if you're getting 4% returns and two and a half percent, three percent inflation in there. Uh, how does that play out for you? So, because I, I think Chris is right on the, from the volatility perspective, and I'm a little concerned that investors have said, yeah, I can handle volatility, but it's really in the last you know, three or four years only been very quick times that you've had to manage it and hadn't had a pronounced downturn where perhaps you're retired and taking money from your you know nest egg and over a, a sustained period so i think 2022 uh will be more volatile the expectation is for more muted returns and that's not just us talking right like we you know looking at vanguard and fidelity and investnet and everyone is putting out numbers um, they're all pretty much saying the same thing. So it doesn't mean, uh, to Chris's point, that there aren't pockets uh, and areas where people can do well, but it does mean that being diversified um, is going to count and going to be helpful uh, and also help you cushion the blow if we do, in fact, have some sort of sustained pullback uh, that isn't just you know temporary. And I, I want to make another point too, uh, Wes, is I think another couple areas that uh, probably will be important here in 2022. One is um, where we can is making sure that obviously investment product and costs continue to go down. So we're, we're staying on top of that because, again, if we have 
uh, fixed income and it's only yielding say one and a half. And as we're saying, hey, inflation's picking up, but we want our products we're using uh, to be cost efficient wherever possible. So that's that's a, a big point is staying on top of it. Two is uh, this concept of tax alpha is coming up a lot. Is hey, as we have tax rates and we we don't know what they're going to be for 2022, whether it be long term capital gains or dividend taxes or, uh, but it could be income tax rates on your IRA or uh, or versus your Roth. So thinking about that strategically about hey where where, uh, where am I getting the most efficiency in terms of taxes paid? And maybe that also makes sense in terms of asset location, because if maybe my longest term uh, assets need to be in my Roth, and, and maybe if I'm paying a lower tax rate in my IRA than I am my taxable account, then maybe maybe I'm kind of prioritizing my growth assets to the tax rate as well. So this this concept mm-hmm. of tax alpha is coming up a lot about how can I continue to way, uh, find ways to be more tax efficient to offset any gains that I have wherever I can, which is not really easy in this market when you see such large gr- uh, growth. But I think though that's going to be even more important when you if you do have a lower rate environment is to, or low, uh, lower growth environment is to find more and more ways to become efficient with the portfolios. So while we've done, been doing a lot of that with our clients is continue that focus. I think that's a great point because it is true. If you're going to have muted returns, uh, where are you going to squeeze out that return that's necessary for you to, to live off? And if the, your fees are too high, if your taxes are too high, uh, those are, you know, not just silent crushers, but they they hurt you in the long run. Um, and so it, it is it is so true. And as you know, it's something we've been preaching for for years. For years, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that that was a really good kind of recap and and outlook, if you will, on 2021 and 2022. Um, I do want to keep going here in our roundtable discussion. Um, I want to rotate a little bit to to kind of the work that we're all doing with our clients and just kind of a question and I'll, I'll start with you Wes here. What piece of advice is resonating most, um, you know, with your clients and, your, and with you, um, you know, right now as you guys just talked about there's certainly a lot going on there's a lot to think about. Um, so what's just kind of sticking out in, in the, that advice. I, I think the single most important thing is to have a plan. Um, have a roadmap. Um, it really helps in terms of not making poor decisions at times when you may be influenced by the headlines or you know even in this last week, there's been a lot of whipsawing going on. Um, it also can give you a little more purpose and reason to the decisions you're making and can set you up to do it sort of habitually and get yourself in the in the right, frame of mind. So I think one of the most important things someone can do is have a plan. And then also you have to check in with that plan, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be, you know, a super structured advisory plan. It can be that, you know, I want to save this way into a 529 plan for my kid, or I want to make sure I do my IRA contributions or max out my 401k whatever it is. And then at the end of every year, you got to check in on that and see if you're achieving those goals, see if you're, you're getting to where you want to be. And ultimately that'll help you, you know, get, to, get to your ultimate goal. So I think just having a structure, something structured in place, some sort of plan is extremely helpful in terms of knowing why am I doing this? Why am I putting this money here? So that would be my advice. And, and what I'm, what's, what's I think resonating with people is let's get some structure and some planning around um, what we're trying to do and how we're trying to help you. Um, because I think, you know, at least in, in the 20 years that I've been doing this, that really does work. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, so Chris, I'll kind of rotate to you here. What, uh, what piece of advice is resonating most with you and, and your clients with the conversations you're having today? Uh, I'm going to uh, build off of what uh, Wes was saying. Um, probably the most uh, uh, common discussion that I'm having with my clients that they get a, a real appreciation for is having a plan. And um, it's a lot of uh, uh, focus on, okay, you can't spend more than you make, whether it's from your job or from your savings or a combination of the two. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of time uh, we're, uh, we're talking to our clients about, okay, how much do you really spend? And 
getting a handle on that. And you'd be surprised that people don't have a good handle on that. Um, we can't, we can't control the markets. We can't control what your returns are going to be. We're going to put you in the appropriate risk portfolio to hopefully achieve certain returns. But the only um, part of the equation that you can really control is what you spend. Um, and uh, my clients that uh, I've had that discussion with, and we update it like to Wes's point on a regular basis, it's really um, important and, and, and they're thankful that, uh, that we go through that uh, to say, uh -huh, okay, this is what I spend in a year. I can, um, uh, I can cover that based on what I'm earning on with my job and my savings and expected returns, or I've got to dial back the uh, spending. Um, so that is something uh, that has been a big part of the discussions with my clients. The other thing is, um, you know, remaining invested. Um, yeah. No matter, you know, it's something that we we preach on a regular uh, basis because it's so important. If your horizon is for a long term, um, not to try to time the markets and uh, missing out on those up days uh, is just too uh, punishing to your portfolio over the long term. So. Remaining invested, remaining invested uh, is uh, is another thing that um, a lot of clients uh, like hearing from me. So. That's great. That's great. And I'll I'll rotate to you, Ben. What what's kind of sticking out most with you and you know your conversations with clients? Yeah, I'll just add to Chris's last point there about staying invested. I, I think that it, this feels right now to me is that, the, again, this talk of markets are frothy and bubble, it, it kind of sounds like, you know, what to Chris is saying about staying invested is that there's a, there's a lot of... Um, um, there, there's just kind of this, this feeling that maybe I should be defensive or I should get out of the market right now just because of how much of the run. And these are conversations we've had when um, in, in presidential cycles is, is usually one that come, this comes up a lot, mm -hmm. where if you weren't a big fan of, say, o Obama and he gets elected and then all of a sudden, well, I'm going to get into cash because it's not going to work out well or or, or Donald Trump becomes president, this isn't going to work out well, and I'm going to get out of the market. Those are really big mistakes. And as, as Chris is, uh, was saying, there's, you know, there's, you hear this moniker and JP Morgan has a slide out there about the 10 desk. 10 best days of the market has driven about 80 to 90% of the return over the last 30 years. So just missing a few days can be very impactful and hurtful to your overall return. So by playing this kind of in and out game, you got to be right twice. And it's really difficult for even the best investors out there to be right once, much less twice and, and compound that. So I think that's, that's a thing that it feels a little bit like I should take control and I should do something right now and lock in some of these gains because we all feel a lot wealthier. We all feel like we've done better than probably ever had in our lives with the amount of uh, wealth we've seen from equity markets happening. I think those are really big concerns about, again, kind of zooming back out, looking for the next 30 to 50 years, thinking about your time horizon and what makes the most sense. And again, that's where I think our job is to, is to manage to risk and not just what might happen next month or two months from now, we're trying to make sure that your money lasts sustainably as long as possible for you. And again, to, to what Wes and Chris said about spending rates, uh, sustainability, and again, our job is to be unemotional objective leaders and soundboards to our clients. And I think that's, that's very important, I think, for a lot of the, the advice that we're giving right now. Just one other thought to, to build on that, Ben, and I, I think this also comes from JP Morgan, but when you were talking about those best days, those 10 best days typically happen within close proximity to the worst days. So it's really hard to, to be in and out in such a way that you're not going to miss out on some of those. Um, it, it's just an interesting side note to that, that you really can't time it. Um, because many of those best days happen right around when the worst days do too. And uh, they, they also, JP Morgan on their most recent uh, on the bench deck that they have for their guide to the markets, they actually talked about investing on a new market high versus any other day that actually your annualized return since 1987, on, if you invest it on a new market high on a one-year, three-year, or I think five-year basis, 
that you actually would have done better than if you mar- invested on a non-market high. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. So which would not be what I would have thought, right? It's like, Me either. Well, Again, uh, you had thought, well, just invest on the market lows and you'll be fine. But I think that's where as clients are bringing us money and they're saying, hey, I want to invest this money or I've, I've, you know, I got a bonus from work or whatever is happening. They say, here's extra dollars. That's a question is, hey, is this a good time to put money in the market? And again, where I feel like I've maybe missed out. And, uh, and that's, I think, a, a key point is, look, we don't know if this is the best or the worst time. We have no idea to know that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time is, again, being in the market is the most important point to get that return over time. And that's important to do. So again, from a timing perspective, we don't know if tomorrow's going to be the high or the low. Again, things are bad right uh, on, on today. Is that the best time to put in? Who knows? We know it's length of time, not not what what day is is kind of the, the most important thing to do. So again, that, that, was a, that was a chart that I thought was 180 degrees from what I thought that would be from a when to do it. But I think that's a good point for, for the clients that are wondering, Hey, I'm not going to give them that dollar today because I'm going to wait for that market to turn down by 40%. Well, you might be waiting a long time. Who knows? Slide just adds more, uh, more kind of reason of how hard it is to time the market. Right. I think mm-hmm. the th- three of us who heard you say that kind of said, really, that doesn't seem to make sense. And here we are. <laughs> so it, uh, and we'll, we'll have that slide available for those that want to yeah. see it too. Cause I yeah. want to make sure that that's out there and that's uh, that you can, you can see for yourself. Yeah. Um, so I have kind of a, a, a wrap up question, if you will, or the last question of kind of talking points. Um, and it's kind of a loaded question, but I'm going to start with you, Chris. Um, you know, there may be more than one answer here, but what um, do you think is kind of the leading reason or, or reasons um, that people are hiring us right now? Uh, I will attempt to answer my question and I have to admit that I'm human. There's uh, two dogs in the background that might bark uh, while I'm answering my question, but no problem. Uh, that's what happens. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, around what we have been just discussing, having um, having a discussion with our clients. Um, uh, you know, I just the other day I had a client who said, "I'm thinking about purchasing a home, um, and I can't have this conversation with anyone but you, right? Do you mm-hmm. think I can handle this? Here's where uh, you know my uh, savings are, so on and so forth, um, and it is." Discussions like that, whether it's investing in the market, it's the spending side of uh, things, it's uh, passing on wealth to the next generation, um, it's uh, it, it's planning uh, generically um, on your finances. That's the 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 part of what Guidance Points uh, brings to the table of having that trusted advisor to be able to have those discussions. Um, and uh, uh, we're not going to have the answer. Uh, to everything in terms of where the market's going to head, like uh, Ben had mentioned, um, but just someone who you can run all your numbers on your personal balance sheet by and uh, have a frank discussion. Um, and and I think that's why people are hiring me. Yeah, um, I love that. Um, Wes, what do you think are, are kind of the leading causes here for, for people? And it may already be existing clients that are maybe reaching out more. So I guess just people who are, are wanting to talk to us more. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I, so I was, I was thinking as Chris was talking about sort of the last three to six months and the prospective clients that I've spoken to. And I think there's kind of been three main themes. One of them, and this may have been accelerated by the pandemic, Uh, are a cohort of people who either have uh, changed something in their lifestyle. They've gone down to maybe even a a single earner in the household. They've changed careers. They've tried to retire early because they didn't want to either go back into the office place or whatever. And I think those big changes in life are oftentimes when people look to a professional and say, hey, I'm making this big change. How is this going to impact our lifestyle? Are we going to be able to, you know, do the things we do, retire when we want if we make these changes? So I've definitely had a few conversations with, with those types of people. Mm. There's, there's been a secondary group, which is much younger, 
uh, people who have gotten married in their 30s, uh, are start, their careers are starting to take off. Perhaps they've had a, a kid uh, and now they're wondering, geez, I've heard about these 529 plans. Do I need to be investing there? Do I need to be, uh, I'm getting stock options through work now that are actually meaningful. What do I do with those? Um, so they're, they're getting a little more serious, I guess, about their, uh, about their investing and their future and their family's future. And so I think that's another sort of trigger or point that people, uh, at least that I've been speaking to and been, have been referred to me, um, have come to me in that sort of, you know, sort of younger range. Then there have been a few people, uh, and this kind of speaks to the last question when we were talking about who are out of the market. Sometimes these people have had a liquidity event. So they have a lot of cash. There are other people who I think early in the pandemic or as it was in the onset got out of the market and have a lot of cash on the sidelines. And now they feel like the market's moved against them and they don't know what to do. So they're wondering, is there a way to sort of get back into the market without feeling like I've you know, missed out on too much? Should I be averaging in? Um, so uh, those are sort of the three main themes of the last six months of people that I've been speaking with um, in terms of, you know, who, who may want to join us and, and, you know, we can offer them services, obviously, to help with all of those things. Sure. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, ben, what are, what are you kind of seeing in terms of, of new client conversations? And is there kind of a leading kind of point there um, for why people are, are reaching out. So it's kind of smiling as Wes and Chris were answering because you just took all of my really good examples because it's, it's like, like, yes, the stock options, like we got, I think we've, Curtis and you and I have been working with a, a you know, handful that have, hey, just got uh, yep. promoted into a certain role and I'm now getting stock uh, RSUs and stock options and all of that. And how does this fit into what's happening down the road? And, but what if I, but I'm getting, getting recruited because it's the great resignation and everybody's moving around and hiring really, you know, big talent at large pay raises. And should I stay or should I go? All of those are big points that uh, that's coming up right now. I'll also um, kind of add to what Wes said about, Man, a lot of question about, I feel wealthier, especially in my retirement accounts, mm. and maybe that sped up my retirement decision. So there's, well, what does this impact look like? And what if I get done now versus we were planning on three years from now? That whole simulation and scenario planning is happening, I think, a lot. And it feels like this, this batch of clients right now or 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 prospective clients are coming to us and saying, I don't have an answer. I don't know what this means. Um, I'm sick of what I'm doing and talking through kind of the career aspect of what it would look like if I went part-time, what would it be if I kept on at my current position? What if I renegotiated a new role at my current employer? All those questions are coming up but they want to know the financial end and whether they could do it and how, and what the parameters are before they start negotiating with other parties or, or bringing it up at work. So all, a lot of these are kind of these precursor conversations to, I need to know this before mm. I shoot myself in the foot and I talk about quitting. And then I say, Oh, was that okay? Should I have done that or not? So that, I think that's coming up a lot. Uh, Curtis, you and I have had actually a couple of clients coming up, to us. And, and they had an advisor relationship that they, they, they really just uh, weren't satisfied when we asked the question of, well, what's not working? What, what, what are you looking for? What, what sort of things are, are, are kind of not what working to what you want them to work as? And I think the biggest thing was they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. They don't know, they don't have context. So if I'm investing in these things or uh, all, all my money's in cash, for example, as Wes was saying, well, maybe it might make sense in certain situations. Maybe you have a life event happening or a liquidity event, or uh, maybe I got to buy that house that, that Chris is talking about in the next uh, six months and I need 
X number of dollars on the side as the down payment to mm -hmm. make this thing work. So they don't, they don't really have kind of context to some of these decisions that they're making. So they're looking for that and they're looking to really strike a balance between here's why I'm doing what I'm doing and how I'm invested to here's what, what that will provide me going forward if, I, if I'm invested in a certain way. So they're looking for this kind of marriage of those two things together. And when we provide that, I think you, you kind of see the light bulb go off. It's like, ding, yeah. that's, that's it. That's why I'm doing this. And even though stocks are elevated or whatever, all the, the other things that I'm worried about, I get it. I understand why I'm doing what we're doing. So why is the big question? I think we're getting this, that people aren't, they're maybe not answering today and they're looking for it from these conversations with us. Yeah, I like that. And I'll, I'll kind of add to Ben, I think you and I, um, we've had some meetings with people, um, you know, prospects or, or new clients that they were more of the, the DIYers, um, you know, and I think if anything, over the last two years, it's proved how, you know, I know we all, you guys just had a great conversation about what 2020 and what 2021 were like, but, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And I think there was an opportunity for a lot of people that get burned there who may not have known, you know, what they were doing. And, and they, I think it kind of, kind of produced a, a thought process that, you know, maybe someone like us really can help and people have come to talk to us. So I just wanted to throw that in. I know we've had a couple of conversations with people who have just, they've done it themselves for 30 years and the last couple of years, they just, whether it's they're retiring or, you know, and they don't have time for it or they're struggling with it, you know, there's a, a number of reasons, but I, I just wanted to kind of add that in. Um, but that's kind of the the end of our list of, of topics here for the round table. So I really appreciate um, all three of you, Ben, Chris, Wes, for coming on today, sharing your ideas and, and having this conversation. Um, hopefully everyone kind of finds it useful. And, and uh, Ben did mention, we talked about some slides there from JP Morgan. We will have those available um, on our website. Uh, so that's blog.guidancepointllc dot com backslash 55 so five five um and that's where you can kind of find some more info about us at guidance point and also the you know the topics we talked about today but uh thank you all again uh you three for your time and, and thanks for everyone who's kind of tuning in and we'll catch you next time